Well, very recently, last Sabbath, some one of you, in fact, Andre, has reminded me about, or we had a conversation about the Twelve Apostles. And I brought to your attention, brethren, that it is very interesting how, in the book of Acts, and there's supposed to be the Acts of the Apostles, we find basically the accounts of Peter, for a while, there is mention of John, and there is mention of the Apostle Paul. And then, basically, from Acts chapter 15 to the end of the book, we are basically reading about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul who was sent to the Gentiles. Now, interesting enough, we find no account of other Apostles and where were they sent. So I realized from that discussion we had last Sabbath, basically, that there is the message about the Apostles and where did they go. It is part, indeed, of the Key of David. It is something that has been given to us in this end time to understand. Because again, we read plainly of Paul's travels, you know, through Cyprus, Asia Minor, Greece, Italy, even Spain is mentioned. But you know, the movements of the original twelve apostles are somehow shrouded in mystery. Why? Well, you know, doesn't it seem strange that most of the New Testament following the book of Acts was written by Paul and not by Peter, who was the leading apostle? You know, did, any, did we ever wonder after Peter initiated the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles at the house of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and 11 that you know he and others of the twelve apostles suddenly basically disappeared from you? And why only Peter and John reappeared for a very short while in Jerusalem at the inspired conference recorded in Acts chapter 15? And then again, as I said after Acts chapter 15, we only read of Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. So the question is, what happened to the Twelve Apostles anyway? Well, brethren, it's time to really understand it. It's fascinating. It's unbelievable. Because there is a reason why the journeys of the Twelve Apostles have been basically shrouded in mystery until our time. Now, in this mainstream Christianity, people are usually told that Jesus chose the Twelve Disciples he ordained them apostles, he sent them first to preach to the Jews. And when the Jews, as a nation, rejected that message, then they teach, the mainstream Christianity teaches, they, you know, that they suppose that basically the message was turned to the Gentiles. Well, that the apostles turned to the Gentiles and they never preached really to, the, to those who would be of the house of Israel. But nothing could be further from the truth. It was the Apostle Paul, he was called years later as a special apostle, who was commissioned to bear the gospel, indeed, to take it to the Gentiles. You might remember in the book of Acts, chapter 9, the Ananias, Ananias was sent by God to, uh, uh, what, how to say that, uh, he was sent by God to uh, basically convert, to baptize, that is, the Apostle Paul. And so therefore, in uh, Ananias, we can read here in, uh, it is will be Acts chapter 9, verse 15, Christ gave this assurance, because Ananias was, you know, vacillating. You know, here is the man who was the enemy of God's people. But, you know, Christ told him, Acts chapter 9, 15, Go thy way, for he, meaning Saul, who was later renamed Paul, he is a true chosen vessel to me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings, and notice, brethren, and the children of Israel. Well, please mark this, the children of Israel. And that's exactly how the ministry of Paul was conducted. He first went before the Gentiles. He also went before the kings. But brethren, he also witnessed to the children of Israel. Yet, that is not recorded exactly in the Bible. But yes, that's exactly what he did. It was Paul, in any case, not any of the twelve apostles, who said... In Acts chapter 8 and 6, he says, From henceforth, I'll go unto the Gentiles. And Jesus would not have called Paul as a special apostle to carry the gospel to the Gentiles if the original twelve apostles had been commissioned to preach to the Gentiles. So you see, one of those errors of the Christianity is that the apostles never after Jesus Christ preached to the Jews or the Israelites that they preached only to the Gentiles. No, that's not true. So the question is, to whom and where were the twelve apostles sent? Very good question. Please go to Matthew 10, verse 5 and 6. And brethren, I would kindly request that you learn these two verses by heart. It is very important. Or that you at least would learn where to find them. In Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. 
And now I realize after I read that verse, those two verses, that there are people who say, oh, here is this Israelite nationalism and stuff. Well, sorry for all of you who hate the truth about Israel. Uh, Israel and the identity of Israel is crucial to understand the Bible. If we do not understand the identity of Israel and the plan that God has with that nation and what God is going to do, what he's doing now, will be doing in the near future and what he plans to do with that nation to save the world, then brethren, we are missing a big picture of the Bible. Matthew 10, verse 5 and 6. Notice carefully. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Listen to the command, brethren. Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter you not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Brethren, that was the commandment of the Messiah to the apostles. So please read it again if you are not sure. Go not into the way of the Gentiles, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The house of Israel. Mark it, brethren. Underline it. Make a note on your margins. Use your Bible as a textbook. Your book, as the Bible as a book, is not a holy object that you cannot use as a textbook that it should be you know, completely blank without any notes. No, brethren, the Bible, what is written in the Bible is holy. The book itself is just the book. Use it as a textbook. So Jesus meant what he said. He commanded them, you see. It wasn't just a recommendation, it was command. So the twelve, they were forbidden to spread the gospel among the Gentiles. It was Paul who was commissioned to that work. The twelve were to go instead, as we have just read, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, brethren, to the lost ten tribes, in other words. Because the, the ten tribes of Israel from the northern, the northern kingdom of Israel, they, they were the ones who lost their identity and got scattered among the nations. Now, of course, yes, true, Christ did send Peter to the home of Cornelius, that's true, but it was for the purpose to open the gospel to the Gentiles. So even though Peter was the, you know, the apostle to the Jews, nevertheless, he was used by God to open the gospel to the Gentiles, but Peter's life mission was to carry the gospel to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Peter merely opened the door as the chief apostle for the Gentiles. But it was Paul who went through the door and he brought the gospel to the nations, to the Gentiles. And there's nothing wrong with the word Gentiles. It means basically from the Greek words ethnos means ethnicities. Now also Peter in his capacity of chief apostle, he did make one trip to the Gentile Samaritans. We know that from Acts chapter 8 and verses 5 and through 14 and 17. But brethren, that was not to bring the gospel to the Samaritans. It was Philip, <coughs> a deacon, who had done that. He, he, you know, he took the gospel to the Samaritans, the Gentiles, and Peter and John merely prayed for the Samaritans that they would receive the Holy Spirit. Those who were baptized, that they would now, they had to be, they had to have the hands laid on upon them, and the prayer that they would be, they would receive the Holy Spirit. So now we know to whom the twelve apostles were sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Brethren, they were not sent to the Gentiles. It was Paul who went to the Gentiles again, and it is the true church today, which, of course, we being uh, the true church today, are indeed preaching the gospel until the end of the, uh, until the end of the age this comes. We well know that our mission is Matthew 24, and we know that our mission is also Matthew 28. So therefore, brethren, we continue, indeed, to spread that commission. And we continue to fulfill what Christ has given us as a church, as a commission. Now, to discover where Peter and others of the twelve went after they left the Holy Land, it's finally the time that we understand that. Well, that has been, we have to admit, one of the best kept secrets of history. And it was hidden in the first century and from the Bible for a good purpose, brethren. If the world had known the lands to which the twelve apostles journeyed, the house of Israel would never have been lost from view. But God intended for a special purpose, which very few people understand, that the identity 
of the lost house of Israel should not be revealed until our end time. And we have spent quite considerable time and effort to indeed identify each particular tribe and to identify them in modern nations of Northwest Europe, British Isles and North America. But meanwhile, I have to tell you, brethren, still, keep in mind Amos 9 and 9, many Israelites are not in those areas. Many Israelites have been scattered everywhere. And again, for a good purpose. Those who banded together in those geographic locations, Northwest Europe, British Isles, America, North America, they were banded there, so in order to fulfill the end time prophecies, prophesied in Genesis 49 by their father Jacob, and prophesied also in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and 33, where Moses prophesied about each particular tribe in the end time, in the very time in which we live. So you see, from the sons of Jacob, Jacob or Israel, sprang those twelve tribes, and then they lived together until under David. Later they separated when the David's descendant came upon the throne, when Solomon came, they stayed together for until the end of his life, and then as soon as Solomon died, they separated. And they separated in the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. In the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, they basically were called now the kingdom of Israel. And in the south, there was the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. They comprised the southern kingdom, or the house of Judah. The northern tribes, they were overturned by... A, by a people who were mighty Assyrians. They had the Assyrian Empire. So in three years siege, which lasted from 721 to 718, the northern tribes were overturned and the Assyrians basically exiled them and led them into captivity beyond the Tigris River and planted, you know, in Assyria and the cities of the Medes around the Lake Urmia, which is basically southwest of the Caspian Sea today. And so in the now desolate cities of the land of Samaria, the Assyrians brought Gentiles from Babylonia. Those Gentiles are mentioned in Second Kings chapter 17. And those Gentiles became known as Samaritans by the time of Christ. The house of Israel, the ten northern tribes, they never, never, brethren, did they return to the Holy Land. And the nation, you know, basically became, in history, known as the Lost Ten Tribes. That is exactly to those Lost Ten Tribes, Lost Sheep, to them Jesus Christ sent the Twelve Apostles. How unbelievable. Meanwhile, the history of the Southern Kingdom, the Kingdom of Judah, is somewhat different because the House of Judah, the Jews, they remained in the Holy Land until the Babylonian invasion, which commenced in 604 before Christ. And Judah was deported to Mesopotamia by the famous Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. Seventy years later, they returned to their land under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah. That is when the Babylonian kingdom was conquered by the Persian kingdom. The Persian king was very favorable to the Jews. He released them from the captivity and allowed them to return. Many did not return because they had a very easy and nice life in the new homeland. But, you know, one minority of Jewish people and part of the tribe of Benjamin did return to the Holy Land. They restored the true religion under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah. And that was probably the golden age, we can say, of the Jewish nation as far as the true religion is concerned. Now, by the time of Jesus, the Jewish people still remained there. By this time, they were now under the occupation of the Roman Empire. And Jesus, as we know, in John chapter 1, verse 11, he came to his own. So he came to the house of Judah, the Jews, because he was, he was a Jew by birth. And as it says in John 1, 11, and his own received him not. And Jesus was of the lineage of David, of the house of Judah. And when his people, the Jews, rejected him, he did not turn to the Gentiles, brethren. Oh, no, he did not. It was Paul who did. Jesus Christ didn't, because he commanded his apostles not to go to the Gentiles, but to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Please keep in mind always that, brethren. Matthew 10, verse 5 and 6. So, instead, Jesus Christ, instead of going to the Gentiles, 
he called the Apostle Paul. He didn't go to the Gentiles, and he said to the Gentiles, to a Gentile, there was this Gentile woman, in Matthew 15, verse 24, Jesus Christ says to her when she was seeking help from him, she says, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, to fulfill later that divine mission, you know, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ soon was slain on, you know, slain on Golgotha to pay for the sins of the world. So to fulfill that mission, he basically commissioned his 12 disciples. Because they were commanded, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They did go, brethren, but history has lost sight of where they went. Their journeys have been, as I said, shrouded in mystery until our time. And we as God's church now need to understand where did they go? And we need to understand what New Testament reveals because the history of the early New Testament church is indeed preserved in the book of Acts. But have you ever noticed, brethren, that Acts ends in the middle of the story? And I have cautioned you many times that there is no one word at the end of the book of Acts. There is no word, Amen. Usually at the end of a book, of a prayer, we have Amen. There is no Amen. Which means, brethren, that the book of Acts was not finished. And nowadays, in our day and age, we as God's church, we continue to write more and more pages of the book of Acts. And I think in the last whole year, we have been writing very intensively and intensely new pages We've been writing new, you know, some new stuff adding to the history of God's church. How exciting that is. How beautiful that is. So Acts adds in the middle of the story. Luke, the author of the Acts, he doesn't even finish the life of Paul after his two years imprisonment ended in Rome. You may wonder why. Well, brethren, we will find the answer in Christ's commission to Paul. Because even before Paul was baptized... Jesus Christ had planned the future work he was to accomplish. Well, first, Paul was to teach the Gentiles, which he did. He went to Cyprus, to Asia Minor, and to Greece. Secondly, as we read in Acts chapter 9, he was to appear. He was indeed to appear before the Gentile kings. That was an event brought about by a two-year imprisonment at Rome. And at the end of that two-year period, brethren, there which during which no accusers had approved, Paul was automatically released according to the Roman law. And it is at this point that Luke strangely breaks off the story of Paul's life. You can see that very clearly in Acts chapter 28 verse 31, because the third phase of Paul's life, remember, was to go where? To the house of Israel, brethren. To the house of Israel. Return to Acts chapter 9 and 15. Read it again. He was to go to the Gentiles. He was to appear before the kings. And then he was to go to the house of Israel. How amazing, brethren. How amazing. But Paul's third mission. As I said, you know, from the book of Acts, we have a break in there. And his third mission was not accomplished. Because again, Christ has chosen Paul for a threefold purpose. To bear his name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Acts 9.15 And brethren, there is the answer why, all of a sudden, the Acts just breaks into the life of the Apostle Paul and seems to be, not seems to be, but it is indeed unfinished book. Because Paul too was to end his work among the lost Ten tribes. How beautiful to know all this, brethren. How wonderful is the truth that sets us free. So Luke was not permitted by Christ to include in Acts the final journeys of Paul's life. Because it would have revealed the whereabouts of the children of Israel. And it was not then God's time to make that known. But the moment has finally come. In this time of the end, that we should pull back the shroud of history and reveal where the twelve apostles went. Please go to the book of James. We have three missing words there, brethren. To whom is that book addressed? Please read it 
verse 1. And when people tell me, well, you know, this is an ancient history. This has nothing to do with us. Well, you just explained to me how could the brother of the very Messiah, Jesus Christ, write this, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings! Twelve tribes scattered abroad. He's addressing his epistle to the twelve tribes abroad, brethren. Have you ever noticed this? This book is not addressed to the Gentiles. It is not addressed exclusively to Judah, the Jews. No, it is addressed to the twelve, all twelve tribes. The house of Judah and the house of Israel, the lost ten tribes. That's to whom this book is addressed. And to those who hate God's law, I'll just remind them that in chapter 4 of this very address to the 12 tribes, and that's today's you Northwest people in Europe, and you people on the British Isles, and you people in North America, Australia, and New Zealand, he calls the law of God the royal law of liberty. And that's why your nations are going downward on the downward spiral, because you have rejected the royal law of liberty. And that's why your liberties are being taken away from you, especially you now in America. You rejected the real freedom, and now you're going to have fake freedom. And your society is going to be dominated by these liberals, these, 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 these satanists, and these people who hate real democracy, and real, they hate God creator. But they worship Lucifer and Satan. So have you ever noticed, brethren, that the letter of James, like the book of Acts, adds abruptly, without the normal salutations, go to James 5 and 20, find me, amen. And compare it with Paul's epistles. You know, in the original inspired Greek New Testament, every one of Paul's letters ends with an amen. The book of James has no amen. The book of Acts has no amen, brethren. Every one of the four Gospels ends with an Amen. The book of Revelation ends with an Amen. This little word Amen of Hebrew derivation signifies completion. Completion. And basically, almost every New Testament book ends with an Amen except three. I think I mentioned this to you before, but let me remind you, the three books in the New Testament without Amen. The book of Acts... The book of James and 3rd John. Why 3rd John you may wonder? Because it's the epistle to the faithful lady, to those few who have remained faithful to the true original gospel at the end of the first century. Because the church, the true church, brethren, was subverted from within by the Gnostics. And I've got about three or four lectures on that if you wish, if you wish to, or at least one. Well, I have got three or four in Serbian. I might have only one or two in, in, in English. If you want to get info, let me know or find it out, brethren, it's there. It is important for us to understand some basic church history, brethren, because otherwise we have no idea who we are continuation of. We call ourselves continuing church of God. What are we continuing? Well, we are exactly continuing the mission of the twelve apostles and we are exactly continuing the work of the original few faithful who remain few and faithful in Third John. So in these three, brethren, in these three books of the New Testament, in them, and only in them, the word Amen is not in the inspired original Greek. Perhaps you may find it in some English translations, which are wrong, but the word Amen is not there in the original Greek. It is purposely missing and the good question is why? Well, brethren, each missing amen is a special sign to us in the New Testament. It indicates God wants us to understand that certain knowledge was not to be made known to the world until now, when the gospel is being now sent around the world as a final witness before the end of this age. And how wonderful that we are participating with our full strength and soul and dedication in spreading that gospel, brethren. So God purposely excluded from the book of Acts the final chapters in the history of the true church. If they had been included, the identity and whereabouts of Israel and of the true church would have been revealed. It is a part of God's plan that the house of Israel should lose its identity and think itself 
to be Gentile. That's what the House of Israel thinks to be. It's all things to be the same that today. People of the Northwest Europe have no clue who they are. Just today, several hours before, I released another of my very good, I think it was a very good interview. Brother and I spoke to Gene Porter about the first five uh, chapters in the book of Ezekiel. And I greeted my audience in the end. I said, in order to understand the way, the way of the Lord, the way of God, you must also know who you are. And modern Israelites have no idea who they are today, brethren. But we should know. We are spirit-led Israel. We are all spirit-led Israel, regardless of our ethnic origin. And we should indeed understand and continue to warn the lost sheep of the house of Israel what is going on, what is ahead. That's Ezekiel's commission. And to give them the hope by preaching that the, the, the world is this world as it is, is coming to an end. And the kingdom of God, which is at the same time as the kingdom of Israel, is going to soon be established here upon the earth. Now, if the book of James had ended with the ordinary salutation, the nations of Israel would have been disclosed. Because, as you know, Paul often ends his letters with names of places and people. If you see the last verses of Romans and Colossians and Hebrews, for example... Plenty of places and plenty of names. Now this is the very part missing purposely from James. And why, you would say, why was the short letter of Third John missing an amen? Well, John himself will tell us. Third John verse 13. Let John tell us why. He says, I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. Brethren, John reveals to us in this letter a pagan conspiracy. And he knew who the main conspirators were. It was a diabolical attempt by Simon Magus and his false apostles to seize the name of Christ, to gain control of the true church, and masquerade as Christianity, under quotation mark. And John was well aware of that. And so were those who remained faithful to the truth in his day and age. So God did not permit John to make known in plain language the names of the leaders of that conspiracy and the city of their operation, read Rome. That is why John cut his letter short and the missing amen is to tell us to look elsewhere in the Bible for the answer. <coughs> and it is described, if we have eyes to see, that city and the center of their operation is described in Revelation 17. In the book of Acts chapter 8 and many other chapters of the Bible, we also have the seat of operation. It was Samaria. And later Simon Magus moved to Rome. And how wonderful for us to connect all those dots, brethren, and, and do understand the fascinating story about God's true church and even the fascinating operation of those who were led by Satan to keep subverting that truth. So the time to unmask that conspiracy is now. Remember Second Thessalonians chapter 2, brethren. It is now, just before the return of Christ. But to return for a moment, you know, let's return for a moment to the letter of James. In James chapter 4, verse 1, we learn that there, that, that wars were being waged among the lost tribes of Israel. James says, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Well, what wars were these, you wonder? Because, you know, no war was being waged in, uh, you know, among the Jews until the outbreak several years later. There was this revolt against the Romans in 132 by Bar Kokhba. But the Jews didn't have wars when he was writing this in first century, brethren. These wars absolutely identified the lost house of Israel, the lands to which the twelve tribes were scattered and the lands to which the twelve apostles journeyed. You know, James wrote his book about 60 AD, so he was martyred about two years later, according to Josephus. The world was temporarily at peace, cowed by the fear, you know, they were just in fear of Roman military might. And just prior to AD 60, only two areas of the world were torn by wars and civil fightings. And when you discover which areas these were, you will have located where the lost ten tribes addresses, addressed by James were then living. All that we need to do is search for records of military history 
for the period immediately before and up to the year 60 AD, and the results will shock us. Those two lands were the British Isles and the Parthian Empire. If you have never heard of the Parthian Empire, please try to Google it out. Brethren, the Parthian Empire was beyond the Euphrates River, beyond, I mean, from Judea. It was bordering with Romans on the Euphrates River because the Judea was under the Roman protection. And the Parthian Empire, brethren, was composed, mark this, of the, those who belonged to the ten tribes of Israel. In fact, Josephus does inform us that beyond Euphrates, there is a multitude of those who are of the ten tribes. But these were not the only lands to which the exiled house of Israel journeyed. Please go to First Peter. First Peter, to whom did Peter address his letters? Here it is, First Peter one one. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia. To the strangers. Brethren, these were not Gentiles. Oh no. There were strangers among the Gentiles, but these were not Gentiles. Because Peter was not the apostle to the Gentiles. Remember Galatians 2.8 when Paul very clearly tells us that he was sent to the Gentiles and Peter was sent to the Jews. Peter was chief apostle to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And did you notice the word strangers? It does not mean Gentiles. The original Greek is perepidemos. Perepidemos, it means a resident foreigner. Literally, an alien alongside. Brethren, it does not refer to Gentiles, but it refers to non-Gentiles who dwelt among Gentiles as foreigners and aliens. As you remember, Abraham was also a stranger, an alien, when he lived among the Canaanite Gentiles in the Promised Land. So Peter was addressing part of the lost ten tribes who dwelt among the Gentiles as aliens and strangers. You know, he was not writing primarily to Jews. He would not have addressed them as strangers, for, you know, he himself was a Jew. Now also, have you noticed the regions to which Peter addressed his letter? You probably haven't. Well, you may look at the Bible map sometimes to locate them. They're all located in the northern half of Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey. These lands, brethren, lay immediately west of the Parthian Empire. And when you think about Paul... The Apostle Paul did not preach in these districts because Paul spent his years in Asia Minor in the southern or Greek half of Asia Minor. And Paul says in Romans 15.20, he says, Yeah, so have I strived to preach the gospel not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation." So you see, Paul did not preach in the areas where Peter and others of the twelve apostles had carried the gospel. How amazing, brethren. Do you realize sometimes how much even of the New Testament we may not have understood? The Old Testament is sometimes hard to understand with its difficult scriptures. But even, even in the New Testament, brethren, do you realize there are things that we haven't really understood? And that we can have much deeper understanding and appreciation of once God reveals it to us. So nowhere in our New Testament can we find Paul preaching in Pontus or Cappadocia or Bithynia. These regions were under the jurisdiction of Peter and certain of the twelve apostles. Now Paul did spread the gospel in the province of Asia, that's right, but only again in the southern half, in the districts around Ephesus the capital of Asia Minor. Paul was expressly forbidden to preach in Mysia, the northern district of the Roman province of Asia. Because Paul says, after they, him and his companions, uh, after Paul and his companions, they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia. This is Acts chapter 16, verse 7 and 8. But the Spirit suffered or permitted them not. 
and they passing by Mysia came down, not up northward, but down south to Troas. So brethren, those were the, the, the regions in which the lost sheep of the house of Israel dwelt as strangers among the Gentiles. And indeed, Paul did preach, as I said, on his first journey in southern Galatia, in the cities of Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe, that's in Acts chapter 14. But nowhere in the New Testament do we find Paul journeying into northern Galatia, the area to which Peter addresses his letter to the tribes of Israel. How amazing, brethren. Are you amazed? You should be. Are you grateful for God to, for revealing to us the key of David? Revealing all these amazing truths to us living in the end times. Now, of course, we have historic proof which confirms Peter's letters. We have a historic proof that a remnant of the house of Israel was settled on the shores of the Black Sea in northern Asia Minor in early New Testament times because Greek writers in the time of Christ they recognized that the regions of northern Asia Minor were non-Greek except for a few Greek trading colonies in the port cities. You know, new peoples, the Greeks, they tell us that they, you know, they were, they tell us they were living in a northern nation minor in New Testament times. And Diodorus of Sicily, he says in his um, book number two and paragraph 43, he says many conquered peoples were removed to other homes and two of these became very great colonies. The one was composed of Assyrians and was removed to the land between Paphlagonia and Pontus and the other was drawn from a media and planted along the Tanais, which is the river Don in ancient Scythia. Today it is Ukraine, north of the Black Sea. So river Don, river Tanais, name renamed Don. Why? The Dan Serpent Trail, remember? Because the house of Israel, as they migrated to northwest Europe, left the traces for us to follow that trail. So river Tanais was renamed Don. So now we notice the areas from which these colonies came, Assyria and Media. Those are the very areas to which the house of Israel was taken captive. Because in Second Kings 17.23 it says, So was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. And in verse 6 it says, The king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Halach, and in Haber by the river of Gosan, and in the cities of the Medes. So you see the house of Israel dwelt in captivity as aliens and strangers among the Assyrians. And later the Assyrians were removed from their homeland to northern Asia Minor. Part of the house of Israel also migrated with them. And there are other, you know, other troops from Strabon and the uh, other proofs historical that we have, we have about the northern nation minor being basically populated by the strangers, strange uh, Israelites dwelling among the Assyrians, dwelling among the Gentiles. Now I have to mention something else to you that you need to be aware of. Speaking of Peter... You may wonder, where did Peter spend most of his time after those first 12 years that he lived in the Holy Land? Well, there is a Greek historian, Metaphrastus, and he reports in uh, his book the following, quote, Peter was not only in these western parts, meaning the western Mediterranean, but particularly that he was a long time, and here we have Peter's main life work for the Lost Ten Tribes, he was, you know, a long time in, guess where? Wake up, British people! He was a long time in Britain, where he converted many nations to the faith. Peter was in Britain. Why should we be surprised? Don't we know that Britain is the lost 
part of the lost house of Israel? Of course we do, brethren. Peter preached the gospel in Great Britain, not in Rome. The Rome was the capital of the Gentile world. He had nothing to do there. He was not the apostle to the Gentiles. He was the apostle to the to the Jews, but also, you know, Jews are part of the lost tribes of Israel. He was the apostle to the lost tribes of Israel. The true gospel had not been publicly preached in Rome before Paul arrived in Rome in 59 AD. And when you read about Paul and his letter to Romans, he never once mentions Peter in his epistle to the brethren in Rome, most of whom had been converted on Pentecost in 31 AD. You know, not even the Jews at Rome had heard the gospel preached before Paul arrived. Because Peter was the, you know, he was the, the apostle to the Jews. He, if he went to Rome, if he ever went to Rome, he would have informed the Jews about the true gospel. In Acts chapter 28 verse 21, we have the inspired account of Paul's arrival to Rome, and it came to pass that after the three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And they, the Jews at Rome, said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning you, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spoke any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of you what you think. For as concerning the sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many, many Jews to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. So brethren, we have here in Acts 28, verse 21, 22, 23, absolute proof that the Jews at Rome had never heard the Apostle Peter preach, which means he never went to Rome. Oh yes, there was another Peter in Rome. Ever since the days of Claudius Caesar, there was another Peter. That Peter was in high office. He was chief of the Babylonian mysteries. His office was that of a Peter, meaning an interpreter or opener of secrets. The word Peter in Babylonian and Hebrew means opener. Hence, it is used in the original Hebrew of the Old Testament for firstling, one that first opens the womb, you see. So that Peter of Rome was not Simon Peter. No, it was another Simon. It was Simon Magus, mentioned in Acts chapter 8, brethren. Simon Magus, who originated from Samaria and later moved to Rome. And he was the leading conspirator in the plot hatched by the priests of the pagan Babylonian Samaritan mysteries. And these plotters, they sought to seize upon the name of Christ, you know, as a cover for their diabolical religion. These conspirators became the founders of what today masquerades in the world as the Christian religion. Well, that's exactly what the Apostle John wrote to us in his third epistle. But Simon Peter, Christ's Apostle, he was in Britain. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And the very fact that Peter preached in Britain is proof in itself that part of the lost house of Israel was already there. Peter was commissioned to go to the lost tribes. It was him to whom Jesus said in Matthew 10, Go ye to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then it's very significant to know that about 60 AD, great wars overtook Britain, just as James warned in the 4th chapter verse 1. He warned the twelve tribes of Israel of those wars. Brethren, could it be any clearer to us? And we indeed have already given full proof in other teachings and lessons that Great Britain is a chief tribe in Israel, in modern Israel. And indeed the house of David, modern house of David, is seated right there in the Great Britain. And what we are learning today is one good 
missing part about the key of David in our understanding and we need to understand it. And again, I'm very grateful that we somehow struck that discussion last Sabbath and I, I, I was reminded of that. Oh, I was reminded how this important key truth, I, for some reason, didn't preach to you. It just slipped out of my attention. Well, now you may say, but tradition is so strong. Tradition says that Peter and Paul were buried in Rome. (laughs) Do you really think so, brethren? The Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is the master of deception, brethren. Catholic Church has done two things in our history. Catholic Church has falsified both secular and ecclesiastical history. Keep that in mind always, brethren. Always keep that in mind. Revelation 17, always keep in mind, brethren. Do not let the role of Vatican slip out of your minds. In our today secular world and with all of this ecumenical love and unity, all these so-called Protestants now and many others have forgotten the role of Vatican in falsifying history. So for centuries the Christian world has taken for granted that Peter and Paul are buried in Rome. Oh, really? Well, okay, Paul was brought to Rome about AD 67. Yes, that's historical fact. He was beheaded and then he was really buried on on the Ostian Way. He was buried, I said, but brethren, are the remains of the Apostle Paul still there? Also granted too that you know universal tradition declared the apostle Peter was also brought to Rome in Nero's reign, and he was also you know beheaded. Actually, not beheaded, but they said that he was martyred about the same time. However, if you take many pieces of ancient literature, some of them are spurious, some of them are factual. They confirm that both Simon Magus, the false apostle who masqueraded as Peter, and Simon Peter himself died at Rome. But the question is, which Simon is buried today under the Vatican? For all of you who are Catholics or who are still Catholics, there is a shocking revelation. Which Simon is buried today under the Vatican, under the altar, the main altar in Vatican? And is there proof that the bones of the apostles Peter and Paul were moved from Rome and are not there now? Yes, brother, there is a proof. And I'm thankful to you who have sent me recently a very nice and good book, which I would recommend if you can ever have time to read. It's Bedes, or Bedes, however you pronounce it, B-E-D-E, Ecclesiastical History. In his book number 3, chapter 29, we indeed read something. And brethren, let me know, let me tell you something. For centuries... Vatican was hesitant to claim the Apostle Peter's tomb has been found. It was little prior to the Second World War that Pius XII, also known as Hitler's Pope, initiated search for the tomb of St. Peter. And supposedly they found that tomb under the main altar of Vatican. But they knew something, Brendan. They knew something crucially. They knew that the Apostle Peter was the Apostle to Jews and not to the Gentiles. So they didn't make any public waves about that. Sometimes in the 70s, when you know another generation or two have passed with that awareness that Peter was never at Rome, then they began again, they raised again the question of the tomb of St. Peter. And nowadays, I remember it was sometimes in November 2013, for the first time in the history of the Catholic Church, after a Sunday Mass, the current Pope brought out what he said were the remains of the Apostle Peter. Oh, brethren, if the world would only know, if the Catholics, poor deceived Catholics, would only know how deceived they were. No, those were not remains of St. Peter at all. Not at all, brethren. Vatican has known that it is Simon Magus, the false Peter, who is buried there, not Simon Peter, the apostle. Well, here is what happened, you see, in the year 656, 
there was a pope called Vitalian, and he decided the Catholic Church was not interested in the remains of the apostles Peter and Paul, and uh, there was a, an English king, Oswy, who was looking for help from the Catholic Church. He wanted to install the Catholic religion in his homeland. And so the Pope, Vitalian, therefore ordered those remains of the Apostle Peter and Paul to be sent to King Oswy, King of Britain. And here is read in part of his letter to the British King. Quote, and it's quoted in Beda's Ecclesiastical History. Book 3, Chapter 29. Quote, However, we have ordered the blessed gifts of the holy martyrs, that is, the relics of the blessed apostles Peter and Paul, and of the holy martyrs Laurentius, John and Paul and Gregory, and Pancratius, to be delivered to the bearers of these our letters, to be by them delivered to you. End of the quote. And indeed, brethren, the, the, the seat of the Archbishop of Canterbury in England is where? Well, what is the name of that church? It's called the Church of St. Peter and Paul. And I was indeed intrigued by this. And I think, I, I still have that, have that correspondence. Back in 2013, I believe, I did write to the archives of, you know, Archbishop of Canterbury, and Cressida Williams, the archivist there, sent me a very nice reply. I asked her, I said, I've learned that there are in your, you know, in your uh, catalog of items, it's written that the remains of the Apostle Paul and Peter were received right there in England. And she gave me a very kind response. She said, yes, it is written here in the catalogs, but the remains of both Paul and Peter are certainly not here with us, even though the church is called the Church of Paul and Peter. They're not with us because King Oswy was the king in North England. And therefore those remains certainly would have been forwarded to the north of the country. So brethren, if you ever wonder where are the remains of Paul and Peter, they're somewhere in Northern England. They're somewhere among the lost tribes of Israel. Beautiful. We don't really know where they are. But they're certainly not in Rome. And certainly not under the main altar of Vatican. Of the so-called St. Peter's Church, brethren. Peter never, Peter, Simon Peter never went to Rome. Simon Magus did go to Rome. Peter, Pater, you know, Pater, Padre, Father. That's what he was. He was the first Pope, brethren. So the bones of Peter and Paul turned relics in the Pope's letter sent by the Pope from Rome to Britain to the land of Israel. How amazing, how beautiful. And then about a century and a half earlier, Constantinus of Lyons took the relics of all the apostles and martyrs from Gaul and buried them in a special tomb at St. Albans in Britain. It's written in Life of St. Ger Germanius. So it is, is it really significant, brethren, that the work of God and God's college in Britain in the time of Mr. Armstrong where, guess where, in St. Albans. Think about it. So those relics, supposedly of St. Peter, sent by, shown by the Pope after that Mass, are not of Peter, Simon Peter, brethren. The remains of Simon Magus are right there under the main altar of Vatican. Are you shocked? You shouldn't be, brethren. You shouldn't be. Because Vatican, and in Saint, so-called St. Peter's Church, was built upon a pagan graveyard, where the most outstanding pagans of Rome were buried. Think logically, brethren. The Jews were ordered to be buried in their Jewish cemeteries. There could be no way that a Jew, Peter, a staunch opponent of the pagan religion, could have been <laughs> could have been buried in a pagan grave, in a pagan cemetery, in a grave, in a cemetery where only the most outstanding Roman pagans were being buried. Brethren, that's impossible. 
The Roman tradition has nothing. And then supposedly his relatives were taking him by. His relatives. Which relatives? He was born in Judea. He was a Jew from Judea. His relatives certainly would have been Rome. Rome was a Gentile city. Brethren, the tradition is totally false. But the truth is so amazing. So don't be surprised. Yes, of course, their, their basilica, you know, and, and, and their St. Peter's Church is built upon the remains of their founder, Simon Magus, the founder of Babylon Mystery Religion. Because what is the Catholic Church today but a continuation of the Babylonian Mystery Religion, brethren? And then Britain, after 449 AD, was settled by hundreds of thousands of new people not there in Peter's day. So history knows those peoples as Angles and Saxons. Anglo-Saxons. They came originally from the shores of the Black Sea, where indeed the house of Israel dwelt. Then in 256 AD, they began to migrate from northern Asia Minor, along the shores of the Black Sea, to the Cimbric or Cimbric Peninsula. And, you know, Cimbric Peninsula is Denmark, opposite Britain. And these were the people... To whom ancestors, to whose ancestors Peter wrote his epistles. <laughs> Those who were in northern Asia Minor, brethren. And then they migrated to Britain. How amazing! Now, which one of the twelve apostles also preached to their ancestors, the so-called White Scythians, or White Syrians, while they abode and lived by the Bosphorus and on the Black Sea? Well, here is the answer from the Greek historians, brethren, from Greek historians. Listen, in this division, Andrew had Scythia and the neighboring countries primarily allotted him for his province. First, then, he traveled through Cappadocia, through Upper Galatia, Northern Galatia, and Bithynia, and instructed them in the faith of Christ passing all along the Euxine Sea, that's the old name for the Black Sea. And so into the solitude of Scythia. End of the quote. And then there is a Greek historian, a Greek author who gives these journeys in special detail, just as Luke had written an account of the other apostles as he did of Paul. So brethren, Andrew, says as the Greek history, Andrew went next to Trapezus, a maritime city on the Black Sea, whence after many other places he came to Nyssa, Nyssa, the French time, the French town, the French city, famous maritime French city, Nyssa, where he stayed two years preaching and working miracles with great success. Thence he went to Nicomedia, and so the Chalcedon, when sailing through the Propontis, he came by the Black Sea to Heraclea, and from thence to Amastris. He next came to Sinope, a city situated upon the same sea. Here he met with his brother Peter, with whom he stayed a considerable time. Departing hence, he went again to Amunsus, and then he proposed to return to Jerusalem, the headquarter church, whence after some time he betook himself to the country of Abaski, that's a land in the Caucasus. Hence he removed into... Asiatic Scythia or Sarmatia, but finding the inhabitants very barbarous and intractable, he stayed not long among them, only at Cherson or Chersonesus, a great and populous city within the Bosphorus. Now the Bosphorus, brethren, is, is, is modern Crimea. And, by the way, the Apostle Andrew, the Russians consider him their patron saint. You wonder why? Because Crimea has always been a Russian land. Just disregard all this modern stupid politics. Crimea was a Russian land always. And they obviously knew, at least the older generations knew, that the Apostle Andrew was in the Russian land, in Crimea. So he stayed in great popular city within the Bosphorus. He continued for some time, instructing them and confirming them in the faith. Hence, taking ship, he sailed across the Sea of Sinope, situated in Paphlagonia. This is in Caves Antiquities Apostolicae, pages 136, 37 and 38. In any case, now you know where did the Apostle Andrew go? To Crimea. 
which means, brethren, Crimea is now southern Russia, which means that plenty of Israelites were located where? In southern Russia. And I wonder, and you probably wonder along with me, whether the gospel message will ever reach some of those lost Israelites in Russia. I surely hope so. I surely do hope so, brethren. So we still have a work to do. Yes, the end of this age is very near, but we obviously still have much work to do, brethren. Because yes, there are lost tribes of Israel, there are lost par- members of the tribes of Israel, lost sheep among the Russian nation as well. I told you very often, many Israelites did band together in Northwest Europe, British Isles, North America, for the purpose to fulfill the end time prophecies related, brethren, to each tribe. However, keep in mind, in all the nations, in all the continents, in all the tribes, in all the languages, we have lost Israelites. And they need to hear what? They need to hear the gospel of the kingdom of God. And I'm asking you, who is going to take that gospel to them, brethren? These lukewarm churches of God that are just caring about their little congregations in their prosperous countries, or a handful of us who are just doing all we can to reach the world. You give me the answer. I'm I'm just asking you a question. So you see, here we find Andrew, the Apostle Andrew, preaching to the very areas in Asia Minor, which Paul bypassed. And from this region, and from Scythia, north of the Black Sea, migrated, you know, migrated the, uh, 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 migrated the ancestors to whom Peter preached, they all migrated now to the British Isles. How amazing! Now, did you know all of this? You didn't, because our history classes were so boring and dulling, and we all hated history, and rightly so, brethren. The secular history, the one history that has been falsified by by Rome, is indeed boring, irrelevant, and dumb. But do you realize now how the true history of God, and the true history of the apostles, and the true history of the Bible, brethren, is not dull. It is so exciting. It is amazing. So the ancestors who went where the, the Andrew preached... The ancestors of the Scots and Anglo-Saxons went from there and then populated Britain. We have already seen that. Brethren, they are of the house of Israel or else Andrew disobeyed his commission. And what about the Scottish, modern Scottish tradition that Andrew preached to their ancestors? Is it significant? Yes, of course. Because the Bible history makes perfect sense, brethren. Start to love history. Please just remove from your mind that history is a dull, irrelevant stories that have nothing to do with us. Oh no! The real history has everything to do with us, brethren. Everything! And once we get to know our identity, once we understand who we are, and once we finally grasp the identity of all Israel, the way of God makes sense. Once we understand that we are all, we who are now Christians and followers of Christ, that we are spirit-led Israel, full-fledged part of the house of Israel, brethren, as it is written in Ephesians, once we understand it refers to us, then everything makes sense. Everything then makes sense. How about the other apostles? Well, we have only tradition to rely upon. We don't have it in the Bible. But then again, I believe that God would certainly, because there was his apostles and Jesus Christ commanded them to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I do believe that in tradition, however it is only tradition, I believe it is true because I believe because it had to be revealed to us in these end times. Where did those apostles go? I believe that tradition is true and right. And I believe that God wouldn't allow us to be deceived about that. So we can rely only upon the tradition, that's true, but I believe it is the, it is the true uh, tradition. Simon the Zealot, where did he carry the gospel? Well, again, the Greek records, brethren, the Greek records show us that Simon directed his journey toward Egypt, then to Cyrene and Africa, and throughout, listen to this, 
Mauritania and all of Libya preaching the gospel. Nor could the coldness, I am quoting you from again uh, Greek records, nor could the coldness of the climate benumb his zeal or hinder him from whipping himself and the Christian doctrine over to the western islands, yea, even to Britain itself. Here he preached and wrought many miracles. And then a couple of historians uh, of Greek origin, Nicephorus and Dorotheus, they both wrote that he went at last into Britain and he was crucified and buried there. Well, brethren, think about it. Another of the twelve apostles is found preaching to the lost tribes of Israel in Britain and the West. But what is Simon the Zealot doing in North Africa? Mauritania, all Libya, well, were remnants of the house of Israel there too. Had some fled westward in 1721 at the time of the Assyrian conquest of the Holy Land of the Samaria. Indeed, brethren, indeed, here is Geoffrey of Monmouth answer. Quote, the Saxons went unto Gormund, king of the Africans, in Ireland, wherein, adventuring thither with a vast fleet, he had conquered the folk of the country. Thereupon, by the treachery of the Saxons, he sailed across with a hundred and sixty thousand Africans into Britain, and laid waste, as has been said, well nigh the whole island with his countless thousands of Africans. End of the quote. So, brethren, these countless thousands, they were not ne- they were not black people, they were not Arabs, shocking as it might be to you, they were whites, they were whites, Nordics, who came from North Africa and Mauritania, where Simon the Zealot preached. And these Nordics declared the universal history declares the universal history to us, which was written in 1748, volume 18, page 194, these Nordics, quote, gave out that their ancestors were driven out of Asia by a powerful enemy and pursued into Greece, from whence they made their escape to North Africa. But this was to be understood only of the white nations inhabiting some parts of Western Barbary and New Media. And brethren, what white nations, uh, what white nation that is in singular, what white nation was driven from the western shores of, of Western Asia? Well, indeed, the house of Israel. And who was their powerful enemy? The Assyrian kingdom. And you see, for almost three centuries after the time of Simon Zealots, they remained in Mauritania. But they are not of Northern Africa, you know, they're not in Northern Africa today, of course. Northern Africa, as you know, is a black area today. They arrived in Britain shortly after, 449 AD, at the time of the Anglo-Saxon invasion. And then in AD 598, when the Bishop of Rome sent Augustine, Augustine to bring Catholicism to England, Augustine found the inhabitants were already professing Christians. <laughs> and he marveled. Well, we shouldn't marvel because their ancestors had already heard the message from one of the twelve apostles. Are you hearing this, British people? Do you see how much you don't know about your own history? What an exciting history it is. But so many Brit- Britons don't care at all. Well, who cares? It doesn't matter. In all of my interviews to Gene Porter, I was always trying to kind of get them excited in Britain and America. Have you realized I've made reference? I quoted you from 1748. You know what, people in Britain and America? Many of us here in, in Europe, in Eastern Europe, we have no books older than 20th century. Do you know Why? Because we as nations were destroyed by the conquerors and all of our libraries and all of our written materials were destroyed from our national history. The first target when the German Nazis attacked 
Serbia, the first target in the capital Belgrade was the National Library of Serbia. They bombed it and destroyed amazing, amazing materials about our national history. We have no records of such ancient days as you do have in Britain and America. You've got some wonderful people who spent dedicated their lives to explain the Bible to you, to explain their origin to you. And it's all preserved in your libraries there. But you people of Britain and America today couldn't care less about it. You just don't value your how wonderfully you have been blessed to have all those records preserved for your knowledge and your awareness. How about Ireland? Well, another of the apostles sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel was James, the son of Alphesius, 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 however you pronounce him anyway. Remember James and John, the, you know, the, the, the sons of the thunder. Well, one of them, James, some early writers were confused by the fact that two of the twelve apostles were named James. Okay, so this James, son of Alphesius, Alphesius he was the one who left the Holy Land after the first twelve years. The deeds of the apostles, and sometimes mistakenly assigned to James, John's brother. Okay, by, but that James was already martyred. Uh, John's brother James was martyred by Her- Herod or Herod in Acts chapter twelve two. So we have another James, the son of Alphesius. Now, where did James, son of Alphesius, preach? Here is the quote: The Spanish writers generally contend after the death of Stephen, that he came to the western parts, and particularly into Spain, some at Britain and Ireland, where he planted Christianity. End of the quote. Note this, brethren. Yet another apostle sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel ends in the British Isles, in Ireland as well as in Britain. Eusebius, in his third book of Evangelical Demonstrations, chapter 7, he admitted that the apostles passed over to those which are called the British Isles. End of the quote. And he wrote, now listen to this, some of the apostles preached the gospel in the British Isles. End of the quote. How clear is that? So even in Spain, listen Alejandro, and perhaps others who are in Spain, even in Spain, James spend some time. Why Spain, you may wonder? Well, there is a reason. Because from ancient time, Spain was the high road of migration from the eastern Mediterranean Sea to the British Isles. And the ancient royal house of Ireland, for a time, dwelt in, guess where? In Spain. The prophet Jeremiah, you probably remember from our previous lectures, The prophet Jeremiah passed through Spain into Ireland with Zedekiah's daughter, Tamara Tefi, Tefi, later the Irish queen, from her, from whom the um, descendants of David came and continued to reign over the throne of David. Uh, In Jeremiah chapter 41 and verse 10 and 43 verse 6, you'll find that Jeremiah was fleeing with with, with, with King Zedekiah's daughters. And even today, a vital part of the Iberian Peninsula... Gibraltar belongs to whom, brethren? Well, it belongs to the birthright tribe of Ephraim, the British. Still, they're probably going to lose it eventually. But Gibraltar right now belongs to British. Do you think it's all by chance? Of course not. Now we have some more proof of the Apostles' mission to the lost tribes of the House of Israel in the British Isles from an old volume published in 1674 by William Camden. Oh, how blessed you are, British people, to have 1674 volume. All the volumes in my country from those old, old, old previous centuries were destroyed in one bombing on 6th of April 1941 when German Nazis attacked the National Library and devastated the capital of Serbia. How blessed you people are and how undervalue you people undervalue what you have. That's why God is going to take it away from you and send you into captivity for the punishment of your sins. William Camden, we read, The true Christian religion was planted here most anciently by... Listen to this. By who? Joseph of Arimathea, Simon Zelotes, Aristobulus, 
by St. Peter and St. Paul, as may be proved by Dorotheus, Theodoretus, and Sophronius, Greek historians. End of the quote. William Camden, Remains of Britain, page 5, 1674, my dear British people, dear British friends. Did you catch that? Did you catch what it is? Even just Joseph of Arimathea, he, why should anybody be surprised? And have you seen? Paul is now included. Had Paul planned to go from Italy into Spain and then Britain? Did he plan, brethren? Yes. Romans 15.28. Paul gives us the answer. I will come by you into Spain. Now Clement of Rome, in his letter to the Corinthians, confirms Paul's journey to the West. But did that include Britain? Well, again, here is the Greek church historian Theodoret, 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 he reports the following, that St. Paul brought salvation to the isles that lie in the ocean, end of the quote, book one on Psalm, and William Camden, of course, comments on the Psalm, on the Psalms. He brought salvation to the isles that lie in the ocean. Which isles lie in the ocean? Well, certainly the British isles. But was that merely to preach to the Gentiles? <laughs> no, brethren, not at all. Remember that the third and last part of Paul's commission, after he revealed Christ to the kings and rulers at Rome, was to bear the name of Jesus to the children of Israel, the lost ten tribes. So this is this was in Acts 9.15. That's not a prophecy concerning Jews whom Paul had previously reached in the Greek world of the Eastern Mediterranean. That is a prophecy of Paul's mission to the British Isles. Brethren, could anything be more astounding to you today? Yes, if you're astonished and astounded, I'm glad. You should be. Because we are continuation, we are continuing, Church of God, we are continuation of all that mission of the Twelve Apostles as well. We are the continuation of the apostolic faith. And not only that, but you see, do you realize now why? What is driving us as God's people to keep doing everything possibly we can to reach the world with the massive brethren? Yes, we are, because we are a Philadelphia remnant, number one. And number two, we are continuing the works of the Apostles. We also read in James... And think logically for a moment. James, the brother of Jesus, the author of that epistle. Brethren, if James knew where are the scattered twelve tribes, because he addresses his epistle to the scattered tribes, does it make sense then that we are, that we should know that the apostles as well knew where the twelve tribes were scattered? Does it make sense that the brother of James, Jesus Christ himself, would know where were the twelve tribes of Israel? Yes, brethren, indeed it makes sense. And then there is this stupid theory that there was a, a gap between the age of twelve, when it is recorded that Jesus Christ showed up at the temple, it was obviously the Jewish rite of Bar Mitzvah, and then, you know, until the 30, he doesn't, he then appears all of a sudden in a synagogue and he proclaims and, 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 and gives the uh, information about him being the Messiah. And there are people thinking, well, between this gap between 12 and 30, where would Jesus be? And then you have all these theories. He was in Tibet and he was in China and I don't know where else he was. Well, brethren, where do you think he would have been? Did you notice who's brought the true Christianity in Camden's account to Britain? Joseph of Arimathea. Who is Joseph of Arimathea? He was the he was the uh, the uncle of his mother Mary, a Roman citizen who was trading for the Roman interests. With who? With Tin Islands, British Islands. So the apostles knew where the twelve tribes went. Of course, so did Jesus Christ. Where do you think he would go? To Tibet? Why? No, of course not. What is he going to do in Tibet? To Australia? Well, at that time, not yet. Australia was populated later. 
But Britain was populated by who? By the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Even in America, before Columbus supposedly discovered it, there was who there, brethren? The lost sheep of the house of Israel. The maritime trade did work perfectly then. There were no airplanes and aircrafts and, you know, but there were ships that could travel all around. Why would he go to Tibet? Does it make sense that he would go where? Well, to the same people that he commissioned his apostles to go to. To the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Brethren, does it make sense? And look something else now. <coughs> we all think, traditionally, that Jesus Christ preached to his own. He came to his own, to the Jewish people. True. But he began to preach among the Jewish people when he was 30. If before he was 30, he would travel abroad with his great uncle, Joseph of Arimathea, to the British Isles and as well. Oh, where then did he start actually preaching the gospel if he was preaching the gospel? And he certainly was because at the age of 12, he was so smart that the whole temple was amazed and all these wise and learned people were just listening to him. And among the Jewish people, there was this legend, as they say, about the ten tribes who are now somewhere in diaspora. We arrive to another amazing fact. Before preaching to the Jews, Jesus Christ actually began to preach, most likely, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. How astounding, brethren, how amazing it is to understand all these historical facts. How amazing! So James, his brother, referred to Israel as scattered abroad. We found them in northwest Europe and in North Africa, from whence they migrated into Britain in the 5th century, and in Northern Asia Minor, associated with the Assyrians. In 256, they began to migrate from the regions of the Black Sea to Denmark, and then into the British Isles in 1449. However, brethren, remnants of the ten lost tribes were yet in another vast region beyond the confines of the Roman Empire, that region was known as the Kingdom of Partha. Parthia, Parsha, how are we able to pronounce it? Parthia is probably the best pronunciation in English. Parthia, the Kingdom of Parthia, ever heard of that kingdom? Of course not. Why don't we ever learn about the Kingdom of Parthia? Well, let me tell you, brethren. They defeated Romans three times. And it was a shame that invincible Roman army would be defeated by a Parthian empire. That's why they've hidden it from the history, brethren. That's why we never learn about Parthia. And another reason is that Satan has done great work to hide from us the truth about the lost tribes of Israel. Who the Parthians were has long remained a mystery. No longer it must not be a mystery anymore, brethren, for us. Those Parthians, they suddenly appear near the Caspian Sea around 700 BC as slaves of the Assyrians. And according to the Diodorus, the, the who probably followed uh, some other accounts, they pass from the dominion of the Assyrians to that of the Medes and from dependence upon the Medes to a similar position under the Persians. Now the Parthians rose to power around 250 before Christ. There is a wonderful book about the Parthian Empire written by Stephen Collins and I warmly recommend it to you, brethren. You will be amazed about the facts written in that book and if you can't find it, one of these days, hopefully, during these Bible studies, we'll go through all those amazing facts that the Romans and Vatican has hidden from us. Well, their falsification will no pass when it comes to us God's people. No pasaran, no, we will not allow those falsifications to chain us to their stupidities and superstitions. No, brethren, we as God's people are going to know the true Bible history and we are going to indeed understand the history of the ancient Israel and all these important facts that make sense. So the Parthians rose around 250 before Christ. They rose in the lands along the southern shores of the Caspian Sea. And that was the very land into which Israel was exiled. 
Now, of course, what puzzles historians, and they're always puzzled over something, and you may wonder, why are they so puzzled? Well, let me tell you again plainly, brethren, if they took the Bible as the framework, as the basis of their research, they wouldn't be puzzled. But what puzzles them is that, you know, the Parthians were neither Persians, nor Medes, nor Assyrians, or any other known people. And even their name, you know, makes mystery until we understand the Bible. So if those puzzled historians would just turn their attention to the Bible, they would not be puzzled anymore. The word Parthian means exile. The only exiles in this land were the ten tribes of Israel. So the Parthians were none other than the exiled lost ten tribes who remained in the land of their captivity until 226 AD. That's when the Persians drove them into Europe. Now consider this. James addressed his letter to the twelve tribes of Israel scattered abroad. So he warns the Israelites against the wars being waged among themselves. When James wrote his letter about 60 AD, the world was at peace. Pax Romana, remember, famous Pax Romana. So the world was at peace except for two regions, Britain and and Parthia. And there is no mistake in all of this, brethren. Parthia and Britain were Israelites. Which of the twelve apostles carried the gospel to the Parthian Israelites? Well, again, the Greek historians revealed that Thomas, the doubtful Thomas, remember the doubtful Thomas? Well, he was no doubtful anymore. He brought the gospel to Parthia, after which Sophronius and others inform us that he preached the gospel to the Medes, Persians, Carmans, Hyrcani, Bactrians, and the neighbor nations. End of the quote. Well, these names are all, they strange, you know, they, they sound very strangely, I do agree with you. So these strange sounding names are brethren the lands we know today as Iran or Persia and Afghanistan. And you might have heard already that the leading tribe of Afghanistan, the Pashtun tribes, you would be amazed, even though they're Muslims, many of them still believe that they are descendants of the house of Israel. I've been in touch with the wonderful lady Margot Crossing from Australia. She has dedicated herself to all this research in Asia. And I've been amazed what I've learned from, 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 no, from her. She has been in touch with all this, that part of the world. And what she finds out and then informs me, it is absolutely amazing. So, I ran in Persia and Afghanistan. In apostolic days, the whole region was subject to, to who? The Parthians, you see. And though many Israelites had left the region already, multitudes remained behind spread over the adjoining territory. They lost their identity and became identified with the names of the districts in which they lived. Now Josephus, the famous Jewish Roman historian, he was familiar with Parthia as a major dwelling place of the ten tribes because he declares, quote, But then the entire body of the people of Israel, meaning the ten tribes, remained in that country, they did not, that is, that they, they did not return to the, to the promised land. Wherefore, these are but two tribes in Asia and Europe subject to the Romans, while the ten tribes, two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, while the ten tribes are beyond Euphrates till now and are an immense multitude and not to be estimated by numbers. Antiquities of the Jews. Book 11, chapter 5, paragraph 2, brethren. Josephus of the land on the land of Parthia and Josephus of the ten tribes of Israel. So there it is. The very area to which Thomas sojourned was, reports Josephus, filled with uncounted multitudes of the ten tribes. Now, apparently Josephus was unaware of those who had already migrated westward, but he does make it plain that only the house of Judah ever returned to the promised land. The house of Israel was beyond Euphrates till now, he says. 
the Parthia was defeated by Persia, not by Rome, but by Persia, brethren, in 226 AD, and then expelled from Parthia, the ten tribes and the Medes moved north of the Black Sea into Scythia. And from there, around 256 AD, the ten tribes migrated with their brethren from Asia Minor into Northwest Europe. And this migration was occasioned by a concerted Roman attack in the east. It backfired on Romans, for hordes of Israelites and Assyrians suddenly broke through the Roman defenses in the west the same year. <laughs> you might have known, or perhaps not, that Rome was defeated, you see, even by Israelites. But one of the greatest crimes against true history, brethren, is that we all around the world never, ever have been informed, taught at school, or by the press, or by media, or by history textbooks about the kingdom of Parthia, brethren. And kingdom of Parthia was the kingdom of the ten tribes of Israel. So Thomas also sojourned into, into northwest India, which was east of Persia, where the white Indians dwelt. White Indians, have you noticed what I said? Yes, that's the historical fact. White Indians, that is, whites living in India. They were also known as Naphtalite Hoons, as they're mentioned by that name in later Greek records. Do you think there is any connection with the tribe of Naphtali? Yes, of course, brethren. And they were overthrown in the 6th century and migrated into Scandinavia. And we know today that in Scandinavia, all Scandinavia is populated by who? By the descendants of the tribe of Israel. Finland, descendants of Issachar. Norway, descendants of Benjamin. Sweden, descendants of Naphtali. Now, of course, they overlap in that territory, but the dominant tribes are exactly as I just knew enum enumerated them to you. <laughs> the archaeology of Scandinavia confirms, of course, <laughs> this event of these white hoons migrating to Scandinavia. Now, who else was with Thomas? Well, Bartholomew, the Apostle Bartholomew, he shared with Thomas the same vast plains, according to Nicephorus, another Greek historian. And Bartholomew also spent part of his time in a neighboring Armenia and a portion of Upper Phrygia in Asia Minor. Now, this Greek historian Nicephorus, he termed the area in his history the western and northern parts of Asia. By that, he actually means Upper Asia Minor, which is today modern Turkey. Now this was the same district to which Andrew carried the gospel and to which Peter sent two of his letters. You see what we are learning about the New Testament today, brethren? Isn't this, isn't that astounding? Does this make you excited? Does this make you excited? Does this make you Grateful to God for all of these wonderful blessings He's giving us by revealing finally all these facts and we put them together, we have the full picture. Jude, the Apostle Jude. He was also named Libeus Thaddeus. He had part in the ministry in Assyria and Mesopotamia. That is part of Parthia, which Josephus designated as still inhabited by the ten tribes. The Parthian kingdom, which was composed of the ten tribes, ruling over Gentiles, possessed Assyria and Mesopotamia during most of the New Testament period. Did you, brethren, know that? Of course you didn't. Why didn't you know that? Because the falsified Roman history has taken care of that, that we never learned that. Well, this is now the end of that part of falsified history. So again, brethren, during the most of the New Testament period, the kingdom of Parthia, the ten tribes, were ruling over Gentiles and they possessed Assyria and Mesopotamia. And let me tell you about those so-called three magi. They were not three magi at all. It's another false tradition. Josephus tells us there was a committee 
diplomatic committee of those wise men who came from the east. Where did they come from, brethren? Let me tell you that. One of these days we're going to delve into that. But let me dispel another of these full, false uh, ideas promoted by mainstream Christianity. They came from the Parthian Empire, brethren. Why did they come? Because they knew that there was a Jewish king, the Jewish king to be born. And they had a very interesting custom. The Parthian kingdom was ruled by a council of elders. The council of elders was empowered to make a decision about a new king. For example, if the current king of Parthia would go sick or would go mad, the council of elders would, you know, meet and discuss and decide who the new king be. All the descendants of the royal family of Parthia were entitled to be a king. And now to your shock, brethren, here is another shocking revelation to you today. Jesus Christ was not only the descendant of David, indeed, but he was also, through either Mary or Joseph, also descendant of the Parthian royal family. Why should that surprise us? Parthian kingdom was the kingdom of the ten tribes. And therefore, being one of the potential kings, the delegation of those wise men from the east came to give him gifts and to bow down to him. And do you wonder how could they be so audacious and go straight to Herod and say, tell us where is the Jewish king? I mean, Herod was a tyrant tyrant, a despot, they could, let me tell you why, Judea was protectorate of the Roman Empire, Romans were defeated by the Parthians few times, and the instruction from Rome to Herod was, do whatever you do, but don't you ever, don't you ever go into conflict with Parthia. And Parthia was the neighboring country because the Euphrates River divided the Roman Empire or the Roman protectorate, Judea, from the Parthian Empire. And Josephus says, no, there were not three. A whole committee of those came. A caravan came. The whole Jerusalem was upset because they didn't realize what was going on. They saw Parthians, because Parthians conquered Romans, you know, including Judea, the Roman protectorate, several times, and the whole town of Jerusalem thought there was another Parthian invasion. There was a caravan, not three, a whole caravan with servants, plenty of gold. Plenty of gold, brethren, wagons of gold. That's why later in Jesus Christ's ministry we learned that the apostles didn't have to work. and They just went around preaching the gospel. So did he. Apparently his parents, Jesus Christ's parents, were wise enough to save that gold up to his older age. And there he was. Brethren, how much sense does it all make? You know, three wise men, three magi came from the east. No! A delegation of Parthians, the descendants of the ten tribes, came to Jesus Christ to, re, you know, to give him, to present gifts, and gave, came to bow down to him. He was one of the potential kings of the Parthian Empire because he was descendant of the Parthian royal line. How beautiful that is to know. Get rid of all these shackles of falsified history, brethren. I want you to become fired up about the history of Israel because that's what we are. That's what we are continuation of as well. We are modern Israelites as well. And the privilege we have is that we are spirit-led Israelites. And that of all the people on the face of the earth, we, spirit-led Israelites, should know all these facts and be firmly grounded in them, brethren. It's part also, in a sense, of the original faith. But it's most certainly part of the key of David. And only one church in the church history has the key of David. It's the Philadelphia church, as you know. So yes, Jude, Bartholomew. So Scythia and Upper Asia, meaning Asia Minor, were the regions assigned to another apostle. 
Apostle Philip. Scythia was the name of the vast plain north of the Black and the Caspian Seas. And to that region a great colony of Israelites migrated after the fall of the Persian Empire in 1331. From Scythia migrated the Scots. The word Scot is derived from the word Scythe. It means an inhabitant of Scythia. The Scots are part of the house of Israel. Now, interestingly, the word Scythia in Celtic has the same meaning that Hebrew does in the Semitic language. It means a migrant or wanderer. So now you know where the Apostle Philip, where did he go? How about Matthew? Matthew, we are informed by a Greek historian, Metaphrastus, he informs us that Matthew went first into Parthia, <coughs> and having successfully planted Christianity in those parts, thence traveled to Ethiopia. That is the Asiatic Ethiopia lying near India. End of the quote. Well, brethren, for some centuries the region, this region of the Hindu Kush, bordering on Scythia and Parthia, was known as, guess what, White India. <laughs> it lies slightly east of the area where the Assyrians settled the Israelite captives. And the natural process of growth led the house of Israel to these sparsely populated regions. Because, remember what was prophesied for the house of Israel? They'll multiply as the stars on heaven. That is why today, brethren, we don't even know how many Israelites are there everywhere around the globe. We can't number them. We know that certain numbers did ban in certain geographical areas, again, to fulfill the anti-prophecies. But there are many Israelites that are scattered all over the place. And then, from there, they migrated to Northwest Europe in the 6th century, long after the Apostles' time. Dorotheus, one of the Greek historians, declares Matthew was buried at Hierapolis, Hierapolis in Parthia. Now, the Parthian kingdom was in fact a loose union of those lost tribes of Israel who dwelt in Central Asia during this period. The, Persian, the Persians finally drove them all out. Whenever Parthia prospered, other nations prospered as well, brethren. Doesn't that remind us of when British prospered and Americans prospered and other nations also were? And there were blessings to other nations and the other nations would prosper. Whenever the Parthians suffered reverses, other nations suffered. Well, no wonder. Remember Genesis 12, 3? And I'll bless them that bless thee, and cause, curse them that curse thee. Now, Ethiopian, or Ethiopic, how you want to call them, Ethiopian and Greek sources designate Dacia, which is modern Romania, and Macedonia, the country now north of Greece, now called officially Northern Macedonia, they designate them as part of the ministry of Matthias. Now, Romania, Dacia, or Romania, was the extreme western part of Scythia. And from Dacia came the Normans, who ultimately settled in France and Britain. The French tradition says that Mary, the mother of Jesus, journeyed into Gaul, modern France, and that tradition, you know, basically tells us also that John John's having been in Gaul in his earlier years he was there with Mary Mary died, he, she was buried and then the, uh, la uh, the last years of his life he spent in Ephesus however we know that it was to John that Jesus committed Mary's care so she would be where he was working Paul knew that Gaul was an area settled by the house of Israel so he bypassed Gaul on his way from Italy to Spain, Romans 15, 24 and 28. He bypassed Gaul, because obviously that Gaul must have been reached by one of the twelve. <laughs> which one? Well, I've just told you which one. John, obviously. And there's some other interesting historical facts, or you might say traditions, about some other disciples of Jesus reaching Gaul. 
So brethren, can we understand any of these facts? Do we see how plain all of this is? How clear it is? So we have historic proof to confirm absolutely the identity and location of the house of Israel. The identity of Israel from secular sources is itself also independent and absolute proof of where the twelve tri- tribes went and where the twelve apostles carried out God's work. Now isn't that marvelous? It's no longer any mystery. Not at all. We must not believe that all this falsified history, brethren, which is so dull and not important, we must not take it for granted and think, oh, what's relevant? What is relevance in that history for us? No, there is no relevance in that falsified history. But in the true history of the Bible, there is indeed much relevance. If I have succeeded to make you, uh, to leave you in amazement and an astonishment, I'm so glad, brethren. We should be. Because we are a continuation of that history. And everything makes sense in God's way. When we remember indeed who we are.